This week on Talking Pictures with Neil Rosen, we'll look at the Mad Max prequel, Furiosa, with Chris Hemsworth and Anya Taylor-Joy, the senior citizen revenge comedy, Thelma, a new documentary about the Beach Boys, the Holocaust drama, Treasure, featuring Lena Dunham, Ezra, starring Bobby Cannavale and Robert De Niro, plus the new limited series, Baby Reindeer. We've got all that and many more movie picks coming up. I'm Neil Rosen. Welcome to Talking Pictures. It's our monthly Critic Roundtable show. We debate what's worth watching and what's not when it comes to new releases, hidden gems, and Hollywood classics. Joining me today are Bill McCuddy from GoldDerby.com, Edward Douglas from Cinema Daily US, and Roger Friedman from Showbiz 411. Now let's start out with a look at several new films or series in theaters and or streaming, beginning with Thelma, starring June Squibb. Let's take a look at a clip. What happened? It, it's my grandson. Grandma! Oh, it's Sam. Come on, get out. Thelma! Thelma! Hey, have you seen a woman with like white hair and a real lady? Thelma! Thelma! Oh, we can't make that. Grandma! What's that? Is that? Grandma! That is interesting. Oh. Thelma! Oh. Bill! Talk about Thelma. Well, June Squibb, God love her, is 94 years old, 93 when she made this movie, and she's kind of an elderly Charlie's angel. Uh, so she's so been strange. ripped off in a phone scam, and she's oh out for revenge. God. Now, this really happened to writer-director Josh Margolin, who takes uh, many of the action tropes from lots of other movies and ages them with great humor. Supporting work from Fred Heckinger and Parker Posey are all first rate. But I want to mention the last performance of the great Richard Roundtree. Yes, Shaft, as Squibb's uh, buddy pick. That Shaft is a mean buddy. He's, a, he's mean and he's older, but he's, he turns in a great performance. Uh, listen, when this film comes calling, don't hang up. Roger. Yes. I thought it was absolutely charming. Uh, I, re I met June Squibb back when she did uh, Nebraska. Nebraska. Yeah. And she's done a few other movies since then. And the fact that she's still working is wonderful. Yeah. Um, and she doesn't miss a beat, and it's a lovely relationship between her and the grandson, which is Fred Heckinger. Right. And uh, I love the fact that Parker Posey's in the movie. She should be in every movie. Um, and they just have a lovely relationship. All the dialogue is very good, very smart. And anybody who's got an older person with them in the house or that they're dealing with, uh, as far as you know, learning how to use the computer, Wonderful stuff, right? Yeah. And uh, and she and Richard Ramtree are a great little tag Phenomenal. team. Phenomenal. Yeah. They really run around. I'm sure they had stunt <laughs> doubles for a couple of things. But uh, I give June Squibb a lot of credit, and she's just lovely. Ed? Yeah, I loved watching June and Richard Ramtree riding around in a scooter, uh, <laughs> like, like it was an action movie. Um, it was probably the, my favorite part of the movie. I did not like Fred Heckinger as her grandson, uh, even though he's kind of like Josh Margolin's uh, avatar for the movie, and I, I thought Parker Posey and Clark Gregg were kind of wasted. They were kind of like not very good in the movie. They were not. So the movie, it's, I'm kind of mixing the movie. I think it's a, a nice movie. It's fun, mainly for June and Richard Roundtree, but for otherwise it was sort of like, uh, yeah. It's 93 year old June Squibb action hero, yeah. and um, with her paired with Richard Roundtree, try, I mean, it, the thing is kind of like a spoof of action films. Instead of flashy cars, they're on scooters, and pairing her with Richard Roundtree, you know, where they're trying to like you know, go against their aches and pains, you know, of, of old age and do these things that Tom Cruise would be doing. It's funny. And it's also, um, as, as you mentioned, with the grandson, who I think does a very good job, Fred Heckinger, yeah. you know, um, he's um, teaching how to use the computer. Listen, I hate those phone scams. I mean, if you've ever dealt with it, those, those calls come in all the time. Sure. So it's like, yeah. This she's is basically the beekeeper, but instead it's a comedy, <laughs> and I think it's much, much better. And by the way, I have the little June Squibb action figure, and it's really cute, so be sure and pick that up at yeah. uh, Toys R Us. I mean, they're kicking butt, and they're like, uh, they've got arthritis. It's, it's cool. Roger, tell us about the new documentary all about the Beach Boys, called the Beach Boys. <laughs> it's called the Beach Boys. And uh, Frank Marshall, who produced almost all of Steven Spielberg's movies, uh, is the director. He also has directed recently documentaries about the Bee Gees and Carol King and James Taylor. 
Um, and he he Hold makes it, very good documentaries. Try it one more time. Uh, the this movie is is all archival because just about everyone from the Beach Boys is gone. The Beach Boys, the Beach Boys comprised some sort of Brian Wilson, who's still alive but has dementia now and can't really speak brothers, for himself in this movie. His two brothers, uh, late Love, brothers, Dennis and Carl, and, uh, and his cousin lady. Mike Love, and Al Jardine, who was their the friend. And, you know, they go back through a story that's pretty familiar, except this time it's sort of um, more of the Mike Love angle from it because Mike Love is alive and can talk. So I had some issues with it because Brian Wilson doesn't really get a chance to speak for himself. Uh, his first wife speaks for him, uh, but that's only up to a point. And, you know, she's great, but there's no one to really tell his side of the story. Still, you know, you love the Beach Boys music. It's, it's absolutely worth watching just for that. Uh, and to see them young and, and to see how uh, they influenced the Beatles, which was really something that probably a lot of people don't know is that Paul McCartney heard their, their album Pet Sounds and went off and made Sgt. Pepper because of it. So it has a lot of value, but just also you should watch a Brian Wilson documentary called Long, Long Promised Road, which tells his side of the story. Ed? Yeah, I'm really impressed with Frank Marshall. He's made five documentaries in the last four years. He's also producing Jurassic World. He's producing uh, Indiana Jones. He loves uh, music documentaries. Yeah, he does. He does. And he, he makes good ones. Jazz, he made a movie called Jazz Fest, which was great. Yep. But it's amazing he's just doing this stuff all at the same time in the last four years during COVID. He's, he's still very active. Uh, um, this movie, I, I actually liked it. I was one of those people who, when the Beach Boys, when I was in the 70s, I thought the Beach Boys were really corny. I was a Beatles fan. I did not understand why people Which like they Beatles. address, not oh, you, totally, not totally you did. thinking that they're corny, but how yeah, they fell right. out of favor. They did. They couldn't yeah. keep up with the you know, the, the late 60s psychedelic era, oh. you know, and, and, and then they come back, they have a resurgence when Capitol re-releases a double album, they, go, they find a whole new audience. But yes, they were playing $5,000 a night gigs, which I thought was interesting in the documentary when they fell out of favor. I'm sorry I interrupted yeah. you. Continue. No, no, but I, but I, I kind of, when I, when I moved to New York and started working with studios, I started hearing about what a genius Brian Wilson was. Oh. And I, I finally listened to P, uh, Pet Sounds, and I, they had the great box set. But we're getting way inside baseball in something that I want to explain to everyone is uh, a really good introduction to a whole generation that may not really know what the Beach Boys are about. The jumping off point for this doc is uh, taking us back to a beach where they actually the photographed uh, the one of the covers. The it's a great excuse to go back and kind of get the gang back together. And yes, they're not all there all the time. It's the beach old guys. But uh, it's definitely worth visiting if you didn't know about the phenomenon of the Beach Boys. Yes, mm -hmm. if you're not familiar with the history, as you just said, this is a great overview of the entire history of the Beach Boys. As you said, Ed, how they're in favor, fell out of favor, back in favor again, you know, I think it's very interesting. I don't agree with you. Um, you know, they use, uh, even the Beach Boys that are not there, they have archival interviews with them. Archival, yeah. And it's, it's used on, in, in that respect. And, um, you know, there's lots of good stories here. How I, I knew, look, there was a made-for-TV movie where they cast actual actors as the Beach Boys, and there's other documentaries on them. But there's little nuggets that, me knowing the story that I found out, like the father sells the catalog for peanuts, thinking it's over, and then... It's worth like hundreds of millions of dollars today. Yes. How we like, you know, really messed them up in that respect. Yes. And there's little nuggets, the Paul McCartney thing that you mentioned. Right. I think it's a very good movie. You know, if you're familiar that. with the Beach Boys, it'll be fun to watch. If you're not, it's a good historical lesson. Yes. Let's move on. Baby Reindeer is a new limited series about a struggling stand-up comic and a deranged woman who's stalking him. Let's take a look at a clip. Every day now, Martha would be outside. This ticking time bomb on my life. I would leave first thing in the morning, and she would be there. I love you, nipple. Think of me at work today. Then I would come back, sometimes as late as 11 or 12 at night, and she would still be there. How was your shift, reindeer? Did you think of me? I never understood what she got from it. She never approached me. She never came to the house again. She avoided Liz whenever she passed. It was all catcalls and snatch glimpses as she devoted 15, 16 hour days to a fleeting encounter. Tell us a joke, funny bones. Roger, tell us about Baby Reindeer. <laughs> okay. I wanna hear this. Well, Baby Reindeer <laughs> uh, is a phenomenon in England where these people are real. He, this uh, Richard Gadd based this story uh, on something that happened to him. 
and he thinly veiled the other characters, including the woman who was stalking him, who is now considering, the real woman is now considering suing him. And in England, there's a story every day in the tabloids about all of these people from the real story. In the miniseries, he acts like he's the victim. But in fact, if you really look at this movie, He's sort of encouraging her to, to stalk well, there's him. There's a codependency on each other. I mean, yes. he's being stalked, but, you know, as you get further into the series, you see that they both have mental problems. and More than mental problems. In fact, I came to feel that he had more mental problems than she did, only because we got to see more of him. But he's a drug addict, and he's got a lot of other uh, issues sexually, and the thing starts to get weirder and weirder and weirder, and you're wondering at one point, you're, you're not feeling that sorry for him. You're feeling sort of horrified about the whole thing. But it's compelling, and that's the only thing. And also, there can never be a sequel, please God. But the six or seven episodes are just fascinating. It is fascinating. Ed? You haven't watched the whole series yet, but uh, one of the things about, I didn't like about the series is that it's kind of continuing this tradition where you have these stand-up comics go do their set, and instead they talk about how depressing the life is, how dramatic. Also, he does this in the, in the show. He basically... But his six, life is depressing and true. It is, but you don't go to a comedy show to listen to that. Well. So, so six episodes into this thing, he does a stand-up act, and he literally like tells the audience everything that we've already seen in the last five episodes. So why do you stand-up comics? I mean, that's like... Mm. The stand -up comics Ed, I'm going to save you a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Don't watch the rest of this thing. <laughs> I bailed out at the fourth uh, uh, episode. Really? And I'll tell you, I, I find it compelling, and I do think it's interesting that these people are real. But I didn't root for either one of them. I didn't care about it. And I got out as, and I'm going to warn people because nobody's really well, said Well, you got it. out at the most harrowing point. <laughs> I'm going to warn people that this thing is extremely dark. It's not just funny, oh, ha, -ha. Yeah. It's bizarrely well, uh, kind of twisted, and I can't recommend it. Well, at it. times it is a dark comedy, and at other times it's a drama, and it's a thriller, and it's an examination of sexual abuse. And I both, wasn't thrilled at all. And both of these people are broken, and as Roger said, it is very bizarre, but there's a lot going on here, and there's a lot to process, and the story takes a lot of turns, and, you know, it, I think it's emotionally effective, and it's a very absorbing film. The you story know? takes turns, and so will your stomach. All right, what else are we going to no, talk no, about? No, no, you didn't make it to the end. Huh? Or, or the and, fifth episode. And you the really have, episode, to, the big you have one. to make it out of that fourth episode, uh, right. and, and things pick up a little bit. Mm -hmm. I, I think it's, a, it, it's twisted. It's, uh -huh, um, you said that. It raises a lot of important questions, and it leaves a lot of food for the Really? Play. Okay, let's move on. Ed, tell us about Treasure. Well, this, this was a little more straightforward than a baby reindeer, thankfully. Uh, it stars Lena Dunham from Girls as a journalist who travels to Poland with her uh, father, who's a Holocaust survivor. Uh, he's played by Stephen Fry, famous British comic who's been not, not in the public eye as much so lately, but he's, you know, good. They go, they go to Poland. They argue all the time. They're not happy with their itinerary. They disagree on stuff. Um, but it's, it's not a comedy. It's very much like a... Very kind of moving drama. Uh, I like, this had me reaching for something called The Remote. I, I liked it. Seriously? Love this film. What? Uh, because are you the, kidding? The, the, uh, the two leads are phenomenal. And you're right, we don't see enough of Stephen Fry. Uh, but the material isn't quite up to the performances of the two leads. I'm a Lena Dunham fan. I was waiting for something for her to do for a long time. And I think this is not a good choice. I, I couldn't disagree with you more. I'll check in later. But Roger, please take, I, I, take the floor. I disagree with you guys. Yeah. Uh, the treasure involved is, is really what the movie's about. And it's, a go, it's about going back to Poland for these people and finding a connection to their families that are lost from the Holocaust. And uh, I found it extremely moving. I thought the actors were terrific. I thought the story was just great. I really did. Yeah. Um, uh, it's I, the, the whole finding uh, of the things that uh, his family left behind in Poland when they had to run it is a really great story. Listen, you know, the, I think both of you guys missed the point of this whole thing. I oh, mean, really? Why don't you explain well, it? Well, I am. <laughs> I mean, you know, he wants to bury his past, uh -huh. um, Stephen Fry's character, and he's just making jokes. In the beginning of the movie, he has a very light tone, then it turns to become very emotionally moving, especially when they go to Auschwitz. But Lena Dunham wants to rediscover his past to spite him, and they have a prickly relationship, and it's an evolution of their relationship along the way. But it's also, as Roger mentioned, when they go, when she goes back to this house that was their house, the father's house that was, you know, uh, taken away from them by, by the Nazis, and there's another family living there, and she has to buy back the family heirlooms and then you know finally you can't bury he's burying this for like decades and decades at Auschwitz and 
cry. You know, I, I don't want to spoil the movie, but something happens and it not only changes the relationship between the father and son, father and daughter, I think this is a must-see and I think it's a very, Froggy has a great performance, so does Dunham, I think it's a really great, really Actually, good I film. Actually, Linda Dunham was so terrific in this movie. All right, Bill, let's talk about Ezra. Well, Ezra is the name of a young man with autism. His parents are played by real-life couple Bobby Cavanaugh and Rose Byrne. Uh, they're div a divorced couple sharing custody of the son, and Kevin Ollie is a stand-up comedian living in New York with his father, Robert De Niro. When Kevin Ollie's agent, drum roll, here's another big name, Whoopi Goldberg lets uh, her client in on the fact that he can be on the Jimmy Kimmel show in Los Angeles, Kevin Ollie kidnaps his own son and they go on a cross-country car trip running into Rain Wilson, Vera Farmiga, and a horse. <laughs> um, the stand-up is kind of lousy, but this film's heart is in the right place and deals with autism in, I felt, a very authentic way. Only a cold-hearted, humorless, out-of-touch person would not like this film. Neil? Well, no, I mean, you have a great cast. You have a great director, Tony Goldwyn, who directed uh -huh. one of my all-time favorite movies, A Walk on the Moon. The problem here is the screenplay. First of all, you see a lot of this guy, you were talking about stand-up comedy earlier, Ed, you see a lot of stand-up comedy. He's got a shot on Kimmel. None of what he does is funny. You do stand-up comedy on the side, Bill. You, more than anybody, should realize how well, unfunny this guy's... Well, none of what's portrayed in the film could ever be on Jimmy Kimmel. That's the other problem, too. He's dropping the F-bomb every now and then, and, and he's ad-libbing with an audience. It wouldn't work at all. And the kidnapping of the kid in a trek across country seems far-fetched. And he, far -fetched. And even if you buy into this unrealistic nature of this thing, the screenwriter is trying too hard here. The scenes that are supposed to emotionally hook you in turn out to be sappy. No, I don't agree. Ed? Yeah, I agree about the stand-up comedy. It's the exact same thing as Baby Reindeer. You go see this guy do stand-up, and he's telling this story about his kid and how everything's bad in his life. And it's like, I want my money back. But the movie itself, I actually enjoyed it more than I thought I would. I think William Fitzgerald, who plays Ezra, is fantastic. And, right. and to find this kid who has this comic timey, I don't know if he's ad-libbed at all, but he, he throws out these lines, which are just, just kills. And that's like, that's like for Tony Goldman, that's a pretty amazing uh, job right there. I really look forward to it because of Tony Goldwyn, who does, who I think is a terrific director, and all the actors in it are wonderful. But you're right about the screenplay; it's overwrought, and it's in some cases it's overacted because it's overwrought. So uh, Bobby Cannavale, who's such a terrific actor, but he's pushed to do it becomes more is more and not more is less. Yeah, you know, the film doesn't set out what it achieves to do. No, ah, it but got I me did at the end. It's going to get you guys are. But all the actors are terrific. And I think uh, parents with autistic kids will will really relate to it. Yes, it's it's authentic in that way. At least it's admit very that. authentic. The mommy doctor, do the mommy doctor. Now, now. That was a clip from the movie Furiosa, a Mad Max saga. It's Bill McCuddy's personal choice as we go around the panel with our Critics' Picks of the Month. Bill? Neil, I wore popcorn socks today because this is a popcorn movie. Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, is, according to director George Miller, the largest production ever undertaken in Australia, and it shows. The prequel stars Queen's Gambit's Anya Taylor-Joy, who smears grease on her face and takes on a biker gang led by Chris Hemsworth. He's really good, by the way. The action is real, the cinematography incredible, and is this a great ride? Of course it is. The plot? Who cares? They're out of gas. They're still out of gas. They've been out of gas before, and they're always going to be out of gas in these movies. And they don't have Easy Pass, and there's no highway patrolman. Just go and have fun. This is what summer movies are all about. Yeah, I wish you had a reaction camera on me while he was talking, because I literally disagree with everything he said. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to make a movie called Furiosa, and Anya Taylor-Joy is going to star in it, 
How, she, she wasn't in the first hour of the movie, first of all. The first hour of the movie is just this little girl kind of standing there mute. Her character was. And, I know, yeah, but, character, right. but she barely did anything for the first hour. And it's like, this, that's the point of the movie. Instead, you have Chris Hamsworth literally <laughs> chewing up scenery. He uses a weird accent, even though he's Australian and could just use his own accent. He did decide to do some weird accent. I was really disappointed in this. I think it's a real letdown after Fury Road. All I know I you see- hate Mad Max movies, so don't bring that bias to this. Yeah. I am not a fan of the series. Thank you. Um, I don't like, as you said, I don't like Mad Max films, and I don't care about a prequel because I don't care about the characters from the previous movies. The only one that was tolerable for me was the first one with with with, with Mel Gibson. You didn't I, like Thunderdome. I'm not a Mad Max fan. Uh, Lots of people Tina love this Turner. stuff. I yeah. don't. Why are you a Tina Turner hater? <laughs> <laughs> What's love got to do with it? Uh, Roger. Oh, this is exciting. What's your pick? Okay. Uh, We all love this movie. We all love this movie. Go ahead. This is Richard Linklater's Hitman with Glenn Powell, who is the it boy of 2024. And uh, he was just in Anyone But You, big rom-com with Sidney Sweeney. He was in Top Gun Maverick before that. Uh, He was in tons of things before that, but no one was paying attention to him (laughs) until Linklater made a movie called Everybody Wants Some, a baseball movie in 2018. And Glenn Powell was like the fifth person on the list. They, they, everybody was promoting the, all the other guys. But I looked at this guy and I said, he's a movie star. And here he is playing a sort of a meek, way, mild-mannered guy named Gary, Gary Johnson, and who gets enlisted to help the police the go undercover. And he pretends to be a hitman, a guy who's killing people. And this is a little bit of a film noir. It's like body heat almost, because he gets entangled with a woman who comes to him and says, you know, uh, my husband's trying to kill me, but is he really trying to kill her or is she trying to kill him? And the movie's very sexy, it's very hot, it's very fun, there's great dialogue, and uh, the woman in it, do you have her name? Yes, her name is Adria Arjona. She is the most beautiful actress of 2024, and this will really launch... She's like launch... an Ana de Armas. Yes, yeah, she will, this will launch her career. So, uh, altogether, Hitman is just terrific. It's probably going to be Richard Linklater's biggest hit of all time. I really liked it. Uh, Glenn Powell and Audrey Arjona have great chemistry, um, but I did see the movie again, and I don't think it works as well the second time once you know the beats as they come along. It's a good, you know, crowd-pleasing movie, has some very funny moments, very wonderful romance, but I don't know if it really works the second time, so it's kind of, that's, that's probably a problem with the movie. We can't watch It's it really time. a good showcase for Glenn Powell, sure. who gets to put on a lot of different outfits and pretend to be hitmen of all kinds of persuasions, and that's almost like a Peter Sellers role in it's that way. It's also like a Matthew Reese in the American. But it has a shaggy dog uh, characteristic to it, where it takes a long time to get going, and once these two get together, yes, it's very interesting, although she does something she should go to jail for, and kind of in this kind of a movie, that doesn't happen. Uh, but I do recommend it. It's so much fun. There's so many twists and turns. Linklater seems to be having a, a ball here with this. Um, Glenn Powell, this is a star turn performance for this guy. This has elevated his stock, like, tremendously. He's tremendous in this. And, you know, it's right not just filled with laughs. It's also sexy, and it's a thrill at a boot. And you really didn't know where this was going. And many times I'm going like, oh, wow, that's interesting. You it know, does have a lot of twists and turns. Yeah, it's a, it, it, you know... Check this one out. I, I highly recommend it. Might be my pick, one of my picks of the week in, in, in terms of all the films we're doing here. Definitely. A lot of fun. And Glenn Powell uh, co-wrote it also. That's something which is getting yes. forgotten a lot. Glenn oh, Powell yeah. actually co-wrote it with Richard Linklater. Yeah. Ed, what's your pick? Uh, my pick is uh, a movie called Robot Dreams. It's a, it's a wonderful animated movie. It actually got an Oscar nomination for animation uh, in the last Oscars in March. Um, and it's it, being released now. <laughs> it's, it's coming out. It's, it's, a, it's a really strange release pattern because it's coming out like in New York and then LA. It's going very slow. It's not like a big, big release. But so it's a wonderful animated movie based on a graphic novel. Uh, it involves a dog who, who gets himself a robot companion, accidentally leaves the robot companion on the beach for months and months and months. But you watch this movie and it's just so, so wonderful. Just it's about friendship. There's no, no dialogue almost at all. It's just literally like a just music and visuals. And it plays really well on the big screen, which I don't think a lot of people got to see it that way. And uh, I was actually kind of a little disappointed because because we're all in the Critics' Choice. We all got a box of neon with that screener, and none of us watched it. I don't think anyone in the group watched it because it should have gotten a Critics' Choice nomination, and it didn't. Guilty. But it got yeah. But it got, but I didn't either. But it got an Oscar nomination, and it's that good, and it should have won. Well, I watched it because it was your pick, and I have to say it's amazing what you could do with animation and no dialogue and still pull so much on your heartstrings. And New York in the '80s is captured oh. so wonderfully in this particular film. Like, I was here in the 80s and 
it's not what it was now, and it's just funny. And plus, there's all these references to, to shots in other movies, like Manhattan, the bridge shot for you know, and in um, you know the Woody Allen movie is, is cat. And you keep looking at these. Oh, there's that movie. There's that movie. It's so it's it's so well. You're emotionally connected to these characters, and it's also a lot of laughs along the way. But it really gets you in the end. My pick is the Netflix limited eight-part series, Ripley. Now, if you're familiar with the 1999 two-hour movie, The Talented Mr. Ripley, you might think, what more is there to say in eight hours? Well, the talented writer-director Steve Zalian has taken Patricia Highsmith's popular book and made something much more gripping and engaging. It's filmed in glorious black and white by master cinematographer Robert Ellsworth, and practically every shot is a thing of beauty. But aside from being magnificent to look at, the story, direction, and performances just suck you in from the start, and the suspense never lets up. It's the story of a con man living in New York in the early 1960s who's hired by a wealthy businessman to go to Italy and try and convince his playboy son to come home. Along the way, there's murders, identity theft, and many con man schemes that are also a thing of beauty to behold. Making it all work is the captivating lead performance by Andrew Scott as Tom Ripley, Ripley. who assumes the identity of the Playboy son he was sent to bring back home. Dakota Fanning co-stars, and there's so many hold your breath twists and turns along the way. This is a real winner in the vein of a Hitchcock movie, meaning a great Italian cinema type film. Check this one out. Anybody? Um, Great performances, not just by Andrew Scott and Dakota Fanning, but Johnny Crazy. Flynn as the main character, and oh, Elliot I Sumner, who is the child of Sting and Trudy What's Styler, on, making a, a film debut as Freddie Miles, the character that Philip Seymour Hoffman played in the original movie, and the, this piece of acting is just wonderful. Mrs. McCuddy said if this thing had been in color, it would have been half as long, because the director fell in love with these beautiful black and white shots, and I agree. Well, that's about all the time we have. I want to thank Bill McCuddy and Edward Douglas and Roger Friedman and Omniel Rosen. Join us next time on Talking Pictures. <laughs>